The last of our lectures, Sensation, discusses the afferent pathways. Afferent pathways that lead from our senses, whether they're going to be the general senses or specialized senses, that will lead back into the central nervous system. What we've learned so far are the peripheral nervous pathways that travel from the central nervous system out to the respective target organs, whether they may be another neuron or a gland or a muscle. So this should help complete the loop, information that travels back into the central nervous system, which we know is comprised of inner neurons that handles the processing of sensory information, which we know is perception, thinking, memory, and decision making. The same pathways follow for the peripheral nervous system, that the afferent nervous system, or that the afferent pathways still follow the same branches. We have somatic and as well as visceral. Somatic, we'll talk about, have the sensory afferent information from the skeletal muscle itself. These are receptors that are generally located all throughout the body surface, things such as the feeling of touch that come from any parts of our body. That type of somatic information can also be split into the types of sensory modalities that we'll talk about. Not only can we sense touch, we sense pressure, we can also sense vibration, we can feel heat as well as pain. Additionally, the last concept we'll talk about is proprioception. More we'll talk about later. Now for visceral sensory information, this is information coming in from our internals. Essentially, these receptors, again, of many different sensory modalities, whether they're chemical, whether they are pain as well, uh, which is also included, uh, these are receptors that are located throughout the viscera that send information about the natural state of our inside of our body, such as our blood pressure, our heart rate, our body fluid concentration, or even the gases that flow through our circulatory system. This helps, all in all, sensory information that can come into the central nervous system that can help us adjust if accordingly. To give you a good example, our internal temperature. Some example that I will use quite some time is our natural body temperature of 98.6 degrees. Now, we have visceral sensory receptors that detect that temperature and will relate that back so that if we are higher than 98.6, then essentially our body will respond as a motor pathway to cool our bodies down, which you know is involved in sweating. Now, I've explained this before when we first started our neurophysiology lecture. If you remember that video that we talked about, we talked about the sensation of information. There was that video of a car approaching a man, driving fairly fast, and that man was all about, almost about to be hit. And so with sensation, that man was able to, uh, to uh, the man's senses were able to receive information. For instance, his eyes were able to see the oncoming car, his ears were able to hear the screeching tires. The next thing is perception, which basically involves conscious awareness and interpretation of the sensory input. Now we know this as a function of the cerebral cortex, one that we described during our central nervous system lecture, but it is the interpretation of the sensory information that leads into the cerebral cortex for interpretation. For instance, I may be able to see that car approaching, I may be able to hear that car approaching, but the perception is understanding, the awareness of that information, and the decision points that lead to the motor effects afterwards. So in essence, sensory information can be information that is traveling and can be entirely subconscious. But the perception is the level of consciousness, the awareness, the conscious awareness of that sensory input. To give you some in, uh, ideas of things that, may, that you may be sensing that you might not even consciously be percepting. For instance, the feeling of skin on your clothes, the feeling of your butt sitting in the chair, the feeling of the temperatures surrounding you, the amount of food that's flowing through your stomach and your, uh, and your small intestines, the pH of your blood at the time. That type of sensory information is not information that's consciously perceived. As I mentioned in the two slides prior to this, there are sensory modalities and each type of sensation that can be perceived is considered a sensory modality. So what exactly is it? A modality is a perception of a particular stimulus, of which they can be broken down to two different classes. We have our general senses, all that from our somatic as well as our visceral senses, that come in as a form of tactile touch, thermal as in heat, pain, or proprioception. 
these sensory information don't come in from any particular specific area of the body, but generally perceived at some point or in multiple places along that, that send that information over to the central nervous system. The next thing are special senses, of which we'll talk about in the latter portion of this PowerPoint. Our special senses are come specifically from very specific organs, such as our eyes, our ears, uh, the taste buds on our tongue, uh, in order to receive specific sensory information to pick up specifically on that sensory information. Now, looking at the process of sensation, the mechanism behind this is follows the same pattern. Or looking at this process, we would see the sensory receptor, the stimulus transduction, generation of the nerve impulse, and integration of the sensory input. Now, this isn't something new to you. You've learned this in the past couple weeks in regards to how we get a neuron to fire an action potential. This entire process really describes how, to, how a sensory neuron picks up that sensory information and then whether it would generate an action potential worthy of sending back to the central nervous system. So all this does is really just break down each of the single steps. For instance, we start off with point number one, the sensory receptor. The neuron's dendrites, specifically for the sensory receptors, uh, we'll talk specifically about the channels that are involved that, that allow depolarization or hyperpolarization of the neuron. In most cases, it's really depolarization, but we'll see a couple mechanisms where we do see hyperpolarization as a result of a received stimulus. And that re those receptors allow ions that enter into the neuron, and that changes the membrane potential of the neuron. Now, as these ions flow through these channels, however they're opened, whether they may be mechanically gated, voltage gated, or in some cases ligand gated channels, this changes the permeability of the neuron's plasma membrane. The next step is stimulus transduction, and that involves an increased influx of sodium ions, or known as depolarization, which results in a graded potential. In this case, we may call it a graded receptor potential, obviously, because these are graded potentials that take place on the sensory receptors. So that movement of ions, whether it's depolarization or hyperpolarization, then results in a receptor converting that energy into a graded potential. Now that graded potential for step number three can result in the generation of the nerve impulse. Because as you learned, any graded potentials that are generated, the dendrites that make their way over to the axon hillock can result in an action potential if we exceed threshold. Specifically, if the axon hillock and the voltage-gated sodium channels are triggered to open to allow sodium to rush in. Once we reach threshold, an action potential is generated and propagated down the axon towards the target inner neurons located in the central nervous system. Again, this is going to follow the same all-or-nothing principles that you've learned previously. Whether an action potential fires or not is inherently dependent on the amount of graded polarizations reaching threshold. Now, as that action potential flows down the axon towards the central nervous system, the receipt of that sensory information is going to be taking place at a specific region in the central nervous system. Again, we broke down specific regions of the central nervous system that are responsible for types of information. For instance, visual information will be located in the occipital lobe. Any somatosensory information will be received by the anterior portion of the parietal lobe. Now, once that information makes its way into the central nervous system, that's going to be processed by the cerebral cortex, and then we can integrate sensory information that may come in from our general senses with other general senses, and that can result in the perception of information. Therefore, making sense of that external information, processing that information, and making a decision at that point in time. And that decision can be exacted into some form of motor response. Now, when we look at the types of receptors, you can see that we have many different types. And the main characteristic on what defines the sensory receptors is how the dendrites receive that sensory information. So we can take a look at the makeup of those dendrites by looking at the structural and functional characteristics. For the most part, you'll see, especially with 
proprioception or uh, sensory information that comes in from the general sensory receptors follow a microscopic structure where we have free nerve endings, just simple dendrites that receive information that result in the generation of an action potential, I'm sorry, generation of a graded potential. Sometimes with a microstro microscopic structure, we can see encapsulated endings. So these are things that, uh, said, that you can see on the image to the right, where there is uh, an encapsulation that surrounds the dendrites. And therefore, this follows a form of mechanical sensory stimulus, something that triggers a pressure to be generated within this capsule that surrounds the dendrites, and then that can generate a graded potential that makes its way over to the axon hillock. So that describes our microscopic structure. Now we can also look at the location of the receptors. Where are they located specifically on the body? Are they located generally along the skin? Are they located in certain cavities of the head? Or so forth. Next we can also describe the type of stimulus. What type of stimulus is received? Are these going to be receptors that are going to be receiving chemical information? Are they going to sense uh, joint position information? Are they going to detect pressure? Receptors are named according to their location. Basically, where is that sensory information coming from? Now, as I mentioned, the type of sensory information that can be abound can be things in our external environment, such as light, sound, that we perceive that happens outside of the human body. We also have internal information, which is relayed by sensory receptors that tell us the state of our body or specifically the organ, or even the tissue, or even down to the cell. And then the last of these are things that tell us about this uh, sensory information about our positional state. Where is our body located? Now, given that sensory information that's present, whether external or internal, can define the receptor types. Extra receptors receive information about the external environment, so naturally, their receptors would be located close to where the stimuli would take place, mainly the external side of our body. Interreceptors are receptors that tell us information about the state of our insides. For instance, our blood pressure, or our heart rate, or the gases that flow through our circulatory system. Now, those receptors would be located by their target organs. For instance, the receptors that detect blood pressure located within the circulatory system. The receptors that detect the amount of food that's flowing through our stomach would be located naturally close to the stomach. Now, proprioceptors is all related to motion, uh, which we can define human movement and is kinesthesia, which promotes the whole study of human movement, which we know is kinesiology. Now, proprioceptors are receptors that are located within the skeletal muscle, including the inner ear, which we'll learn at the latter end of this lecture. They provide information about our position in space and the movement of our joints. These include the reflexes that we learned previously from our muscle spindles, our Golgi tendon organs, and a couple more that we'll learn. So what types of stimuli exist? Well, they can be broken down uh, into mechanical, thermal, chemical, and electromagnetic. And we'll learn about the types of receptors that receive this information and transduce that into our graded potentials. Now, what's interesting about the process of sensory reception is that whenever a receptor receives that sensory information and converts that into a graded potential, eventually which builds up into an action potential which flows down to the central nervous system. In that process, what happens to exposure to continual stimulus? For instance, a constant buzzing sound will still generate action potentials that will over time decrease in amplitude. So this process we call adaptation. So it's basically where our senses adapt to that sensory information and reduce the amount of action potentials that are sent over to the central nervous system. In this process, this accommodation that takes place on the receptor itself decreases the number of action potentials and therefore the perception of that sensation starts to decrease.
even though the stimulus persists. So whether those receptors quickly adapt or slowly adapt, we'll be able to see as we go through. For instance, what happens at the perception of pain? That initial pain that you feel after some form of injury, and of course, depending on the magnitude of the injury, may start as a sharp pain, but over time will start to dull out. Even though those receptors are still stimulated, the generation of those action potentials that flow back to the central nervous system will start to decrease. That's a process of adaptation. Now, when we look at the sensory pathways, everything from our sensory neuron all the way down to the cerebral cortex, we're always going to follow the same set of pathways. And this is going to be a group of three neurons, our first order neurons, our second order neurons, and third order neurons that will take that sensory information to that specific area in the cerebral cortex. Now keep in mind, I did say all, but there is an exception. And that exception we'll discuss later on involves the olfactory system. So the first order neurons are the sensory neurons that receive the information from that stimulus and result in a graded potential that is sent down the axon. And that, this we discussed follows the same pathway. We have sensory information that flows in through the, uh, through the spinal nerve or the cranial nerve, will pass through the unipolar cell body that's located in the dorsal root ganglion, will travel up through the dorsal root into the dorsal gray horn. As that information flows through, it can travel up the any of the columns, whether they're looking at the anterior columns, lateral columns, or posterior columns of white matter to travel it up to the medulla oblongata. Once that axon, that first order neuron axon, ends over at the medulla oblongata, we're going to be able to see that's going to terminate on the second order neuron. The second order neuron are going to be located within the nuclei of the medulla oblongata. And what we're going to see is that information is going to travel through the decusation of the pyramids. As you remember from our central nervous system lecture, we talked about the medulla oblongata and an area called with decusation of the pyramids. This is the area where 90% of sensory information will cross through to the contralateral side of the central nervous system. That information will uh, travel down that axon as it passes the decusation and moves to up towards the thalamus. Now from the thalamus, we're going to see that the second order neurons terminate on the third order neurons. And that, that third order neuron will connect from the thalamus to that specific area of the cerebral cortex that's responsible for receiving that information. So any type of somatosensory information that comes in from the general senses will make its way through the first order, second order neuron, third order neuron from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory area of the cerebral cortex. And as you remember, that somatosensory area has generalized regions of where that sensory information results in. Areas of the brain that are finely attuned to more sensory information will represent a bigger area of that gray matter of that somatosensory cortex. And areas that receive sensory information generally will have a smaller uh, cross-section of that somatosensory cortex. What I'm talking about specifically is our somatosensory homunculus. Now, the direction of where that information travels depends on the location of the body. So as we discussed previously in our spinal cord slice, we mentioned that any information that travels from the dorsal side of the body, anything behind the spinal cord will travel through the dorsal rami. And that includes both intro and extra receptors that send information, uh, send afferent information over to the central nervous system. Now, any of the extra receptors and interoceptors of anything anterolateral, that is to the side and front of the spinal cord, will send that information through the ventral ramus. And any other interoceptors of the actual visceral organs, typically from the autonomic nervous pathways, will travel through the rami communicantes. All those will converge into the spinal nerve, pass through the dorsal root ganglion, and travel over to the dorsal gray horn, 
to make its way back up to the central nervous system, up to the cerebral cortex. Now these next two slides are less important. They simply describe the sensory pathways for somatic information that leads over to the cerebral cortex and which pathway they follow. They still follow the same three order neurons from our first order, second order, and third order neuron, but the pathways that they take may differ. For instance, the posterior column medial lemniscus is a pathway that travels utilizing the posterior white column and then the medial lemniscus located within the midbrain. So looking at this pathway, you can see that crossing over actually takes place over at the medulla oblongata and travels over to the thalamus where the third order neuron travels over back to the primary somatosensory cortex. So what types of sensory information are utilized? Fine touch, stereostignosis, which is our ability to recognize shapes, sizes, and textures, and then proprioception and vibratory sensations. That type of somatosensory information typically follows this path. On the other hand, we have our anterolateral and spinothalamic sensory pathways, in which we still see that same sensory information, the first order neurons that travel through the dorsal root, past the dorsal root ganglion, those second order neurons will then travel across, move over to the anterior or lateral spinothalamic tracts to make its way over up to the thalamus. Hence, spino, meaning spine, thalamic, which denotes its designation for the thalamus for the second order neurons. So these, as they travel up, will not cross over the medulla oblongata because it's already crossed over through the gray commissure of that corresponding spinal cord. As it makes its way up, you'll see it'll travel through those white columns, back over to for the thalamus, where the third order neuron will again target that same somatosensory cortex. Now, which types of neurons will travel through the lateral as well as the anterior? Lateral typically co conveys pain and temperature information. So receptors that receive pain and receptors that measure thermal sensory information will typically utilize the lateral tract, while the anterior tract will typically allow for the sensation of tickle, itch, crude touch, and pressure. So again, general sensory touch information that utilizes the anterior tracts. Again, not as important. Now, this is exactly where the somatosensory area is of the parietal cortex. So this area specifically, looking at the anterior portion of the parietal lobe, which is divided, at least the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe are divided by the central sulcus. Now this area of the somatosensory cortex has areas that you can see that correspond to specific areas of the body for the general sensory sense of touch. Notice how the face, particularly the mouth, upper lips, tongue, represent a larger area of the somatosensory cortex. And that's because these areas of the body receive lots of sensory information, lots of somatosensory neurons that correspond to these areas because they typically receive a lot of somatosensory information. Look at the area representing the hands, again, a larger slice of the somatosensory cortex. Now areas that receive less information, such as the pharynx, the elbow, certain areas of the head and the neck and the trunk, correspond to very smaller areas. So areas over here are far less sensitive because there's less somatosensory neurons in those areas. I'm sure you know by now that if you were to bite your tongue or bite your lip, you can receive that, you can sense that information more readily as opposed to areas that have less somatosensory neurons. In other words, areas that represent a larger slice of the somatosensory area are the most sensitive areas. Now looking at the pathways for proprioception, again, movement information over to not the cerebral cortex, but over to the cerebellum, will also follow the same pathways where we see posterior and anterior pathways, except these are gonna be the spinocerebellar tracts. Now the information that for proprioception from our joints, our muscles, including the inner ear, are gonna send that information over to the cerebellum. 
as we discussed, which is responsible for correcting any unintended movements. So all that type of information that travels over to the cerebellum is typically subconscious. So sensory information travels to the cerebellum and we're not consciously aware of our position and kinesthetic of our perception of kinesthetic sensory information. But why is it important? It's extremely critical for our posture, our balance, and again, our position in the world. Everyday activities such as walking, riding a bike, eating, or any other behaviors that we're trying to perform could not be achieved with, without sensory information being sent over to the cerebellum. Let's take a look at proprioception. As I mentioned, proprioception is information about their muscle, joints, tendons, as well as sensory information coming in from the inner ear to tell us our position. So our proprioceptors, the ones that we'll be describing today, the ones that are located in the muscle joints and tendons, tell us about the position of the limbs and the amount of muscle tension that's occurring in that particular muscle. The ones located in the inner ear, which we'll describe again later at the end of this lecture, tell us the position of our head in relation to gravity. So we have these hair cells that, are, that we'll be describing that will determine our position and the amount of movement that's taking place that can differentiate whether we're standing still, moving left, moving right, up, down, whichever direction we're trying to move. So the whole purpose of this is to be able to determine how much muscular effort is needed to perform a task. And the way we can measure that muscular effort is through the muscle tension as well as the tendon tension as well as the receptors located within the joint that tell us the amount of joint force and joint position and joint angle that's taking place. So combine all that information that we can tell us, are we able to actually perform that particular task? An example that we can think of is climbing up the stairs. How do we know as we move up the stairs, how do we know how much force is needed to generate to allow us to move up to the next step? Well, all that sensory information that's, uh, that's traveling from the leg will be sent over to the cerebellum as well as the cerebral cortex to, to be able to process that information within the central nervous system. So the three types of proprioceptors, two of which we've already discussed in a previous lecture, include our muscle spindles, our tendon organs, and our joint receptors. Muscle spindles are located within the muscle fibers themselves, and they run in parallel to each of those contractile muscle fibers. These muscle spindles, again, a very specific type of sensory receptor, basically monitor any changes to the actual muscle length. So as a muscle starts to stretch, a muscle spindle detects the changes in the length of it and can result in the generation of an action potential that can be sent over to that respective target organ, whether again, whether it's the brain or cerebellum. So changes in the muscle length can then be able to let us know the degree of muscle contraction that's taking place. So if we were to take a look at the receptors of the actual muscle spindles themselves, we can see that we have these nerve endings, the dendrites that are located within and infused within the muscle fiber itself. The amount of muscle spindles that are located with a muscle really depends on the degree of, of motion control that we need to exhibit. For instance, any of the areas of the quadriceps will have far less muscle spindles than areas that require fine motor control, such as the fingers and the eyes. The next, as we discussed, are our tendon organs. And these are located within, as you can surmise from the name, the tendons. These are also known as the Golgi tendon organs, as we described in our somatic nervous system within the peripheral nervous system lecture. So these tendon organs are located within the tendon itself, which is in series with the muscle belly. And the purpose of the Golgi tendon organ is to determine the amount of force that is being forced upon on that tendon by the amount of muscle contraction that's taking place. So the Golgi tendon organ is responsible for protecting the tendon as well as the muscle and as well as the bone from a, of an excessive amount of contraction that's taking place. So taking a look at the sensory receptor itself, you can see that they're embedded within the tendon, right within that collagenous ma uh, matrix that, that we find in the tendon itself. And it's intertwined within the fibers. 
as mus muscle tension uh, it starts to increase, muscle spindles that we described in the prior slide would fire less mm -hmm. simply because we're not seeing any stretching occurring in the muscle fiber. However, the amount of sensory information that we're receiving from the Golgi tendon starts to increase due to the increasing load on the tendon. The last of these are going to be our joint receptors. And the joint receptors are located, as you can surmise from the name, are located within the joints themselves. So these sensory dendrites are located within the articular capsules of the synovial joints. So these nerve endings located in the joints themselves will tell us the amount of pressure that's taking place. So this we'll be able to see uh, is comprised of a Pacinian corpuscle, which we'll describe on a later couple slides. And the changing pressure that takes place in a joint can tell us the speed of joint movement. So as you can see from these three proprioceptors that are located within the tissues involved in movement will convey information such as the amount of stretch, muscle tone that's taking place done by our muscle spindles, the amount of muscle load imposed on the Golgi tendon organ, and as well as, as, well as the joint receptor that tells us the amount of joint movement taking place. The last sensory information for tactile reception includes our skin receptors. As you can surmise, these are receptors that are located within the skin that tell us uh, different types of sensory modalities, whether pressure, temperature, or touch, as well as pain. So here you can see the touch receptors that are located all throughout the different layers of the skin are located at the top in the epidermis, the dermis, as well as the subcutaneous layers. The touch receptors uh, that are located towards the top, such as our Merkel discs and our Mer Meissner corpuscles, which really differ uh, in terms of the dendrites themselves, where our Merkel discs are free nerve endings located just underneath the epidermis, and Meissner corpuscles, which are the sensory receptors located within a pressure, located within a capsule that allow us to detect the degrees of fine touch that takes place. So things that barely scrape against the skin, you know, these receptors will, will fire graded potentials that could result in action potentials that travel over to the central nervous system. We also see uh, receptors located in our root hair plexus. Again, these are nerve endings that are, are all grouped together within the root of the hair itself. So any movement of the hair, any sort of touch that results in the movement of that hair will be picked up by the plexus that will again send information about fine levels of touch. Now pressure receptors such as our Pacinian corpuscles, which are typically deeper in the deepest layers of the dermis itself, uh, also will receive information only when we get even deeper levels of touch. So activation of uh, the Pacinian corpuscles as well as our Meissner and Merkel discs that take place with higher degrees of touch will be stimulated and that way we can tell the degree of pressure that's being placed on the skin. For temperature receptors again you can see these scattered throughout from the uh, dermal layers uh, and I'm not concerned about you guys remembering the names, but we have Krauss end bulbs, Ruffini endings um, that are all located throughout that can tell us other modalities involved. Temperature, as well as pain. Our next topic involves nociception. And the term noci, uh, or the prefix noci, noci uh, is related to the term noxious. It used to be called noxiception, N-O-X-I-ception. In 1906, we had a British neurophysiologist named Charles Sherrington who discovered nociception and the whole concept of pain. And what Charles Sherrington noticed is that we respond to these stimuli. And, and, and his theories involved of why nociception is important. In other words, why is pain even really all that important? Well, there's a lot of theories behind the the process of pain that helps us detect uh, any dangers and also serve as a, as a protective property to prevent us from uh, further damage. Now pain uh, information travels through these nociceptors which have been identified much later on and when we look at the these 
nerve endings in nociceptors, they are chemoreceptive, meaning they respond to particular chemicals as a result of tissue damage, whether it may be thermal, mechanical, or chemical stimuli that result in those pain. While we won't really take a look at the primary mechanisms behind nociception, generally speaking, what it comes down to are the chemical signals that are being sent in. So whether they are inflammatory markers, things that we'll learn uh, known as prostaglandins, uh, they can detect uh, the changes in pH, they can detect the changes in temperature that takes place um, uh, that may be related to pain, such as heat, extreme heat, or anything like that. Um, that type of information travels through to the central nervous system through two primary methods. And those methods can be described by the types of pains that can be exhibited, whether it's fast pain or slow pain. So fast pain typically is something that is acute and very localized, meaning it comes from a particular point. This you can think of as a pinpoint on the skin that sends information along um, axons that are characterized as myelinated with medium diameter. So these are larger axons that do have myelination provided by our Schwann cells that wrap around the axon. And as we know, myelinated fibers, especially with larger uh, diameter axons, can send axons fair, uh, can send generated action potentials fast back over to the central nervous system. However, slow pain, now these are the sort of chronic dull pains that don't have a particular location. Let's say uh, you've had uh, a good bout of low back pain. You can't really pinpoint exactly where it's taking place, but you know it's coming from that general area. So that stimulus that's taking place that, that, that may vary in the amount of intensity uh, is conducted down through smaller diameter unmyelinated fibers. And as we know, the smaller the di diameter of the axon fibers, the slower the uh, action potential propagation that takes place. And again, unmyelinated fibers are characteristic of continuous uh, conduction down that axon. Now, we can have different types of somatic pain, again, types of different body pain, whether it's superficial or deep. Superficial pain typically takes place with the stimulation of these receptors that we discussed in our prior slide. In, uh, stimulation of these types of receptors that can take place that sends that information back over to the central nervous system. Now, deep somatic pain can be caused by receptors of the deeper layers, not within the skin itself, but from the muscles, joints, tendons, and the fascia surrounding the muscle themselves. Now, visceral pain uh, results from the nociceptors in the visceral organs. So our organs do contain, depending on which organs we're looking at, do contain pain receptors. Now, the thing with our skin is we can typically detect where that pain is taking place, whether it's a superficial or any pain of the muscles or joints or tendons, uh, which we, again, we can generally pinpoint where those take place. Visceral pain, however, is much deeper. And so therefore we can't quite localize where it takes place. So we may start to feel uh, a phenomenon that's called referred pain, meaning an area on our skin that corresponds to that uh, particular organ can be felt. The, this concept is explored on the next slide over where we can see common patterns of referred visceral pain. So as you can see, areas of the heart uh, that are pain felt uh, that corresponds to the heart can take place anywhere uh, on the upper left side of our bodies and can actually travel down the medial side of our left arm. So if, if we feel any shooting pain that takes place, down uh, the medial side of our arm can correspond to any heart issues. So while the heart is obviously located in this general area, we know that pain can travel down through and can indicate. Any areas of the liver and gallbladder can be experienced uh, on, on our right shoulder, despite being far from its original location. An example of referred pain for heart pain is angina pectoris, which typically is, uh, which people will typically say they feel a shooting pain down their hand that starts up from their chest and travels all the way down the medial side. So this radiating pain is typically caused by nociceptors located in the heart where 
the heart tissue isn't received enough, receiving enough oxygen and is undergoing that condition called ischemia. That's basically the lack of oxygen. So due to that, those, the, the pain receptors will, will light up and travel through, and we can experience that shooting pain indicative of pain that's actually taking place in the heart itself. Now, there's no real known causality for this, and there's a lot of theories behind the reasons for why we're receiving visceral pain, and that's all related to the presence of what are called dermatomes, and something you don't really need to know. But these are areas of skin that are innervated by the spinal nerve uh, that can also innervate the organ as well. So as a result, when we feel pain, we can feel pain in those areas. We may think that it's taking place in, in the skin or maybe a nerve surrounding the area, but it's actually deeper visceral pain that's taking place. Now onto the special senses. Special senses include smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Now what's characteristic about these special senses is that these contain external receptors that are located specifically in regions in the head. That there are anatomically distinct structures that are attuned to be able to pick up the respective stimuli and then form those pathways that travel those same three order neurons to the central nervous system. Now these receptors are very distinct from one another that pick up the different special senses for smell, taste, vision, and hearing. And like I said, they're located in areas of the head, as opposed to the general senses with proprioception and skin receptors that are attuned to pain, temperature, and so forth, that are located generally across the entire surface of the skin, as well as the inside of the human body. The first one we're going to look at is olfaction. And olfaction is the sense and perception of smell. Now the main characteristic of olfaction when we talk about the type of stimulus that is received is this is a chemical stimulus. When we look at uh, both olfaction as well as gustatory, you'll see again all of these are leading to the cerebral cortex uh, and will also actually travel through the limbic system. The limbic system is a group of four brain nuclei and fiber tracts that form that ring around the brain stem. And we learned that the limbic system, which also comprises the hypothalamus, is an important neural basis for emotions. So when talking about olfaction, as I mentioned previously in class, olfaction can be tied to the emotional responses, or rather the emotional responses can be tied into our sense of smell. So when we think back fondly to some memory in our past, we can probably be able to trigger uh, those senses of smell. We can probably smell something. We, we can remember the smell of certain people where they exhibit pheromones. And pheromones, we'll learn a little bit later on, uh, are hormones that are released into the air and they trigger social responses. And uh, when we look at Olfaction, olfaction and gustation typically are things that work hand in hand, the sense of smell and the sense of taste. We exhibit higher sensitivity for olfaction than we do actually our sense of taste. For instance, think about what happens when you go out to a nice dinner and you see the dinner in front of you. You can see that you're, the tasting of that food is really tied into olfaction. I know you're not necessarily smelling uh, your food all the time, but the, the act of taste really relies on the sense of smell. Now think about what happens when you have a cold and you find it rather difficult to taste your food. Your food tastes much blander um, and, and that's really tied in due to the congestion that's taking place in your nose that prevent or at least limit the amount of olfaction that's taking place. Now the stimulant for olfaction is called an odorant. So these odorants, like I said, are chemical in nature and all really are, are sensed by the chemical structure of the odorant itself. So we'll take a look at some pleasant ones and we'll look at some of the noxious odorants. Here you can see the structure of the particular odorants that are present in air. Now these odorants are dissolved in very small concentrations in the air and they float, around, float along until they're actually picked up by our sensory receptors, which we'll look at in a little bit. But our uh, odorants for flowers you can see exhibit certain structures, and each of these vary. So if I were to give you a structure for uh, linalool, that would be the smell of lilies. And you can see that there's other similar structures 
for that particular odorant. If we take a look at a pinene, things that are typically found in pine or chrysanthemums, you can see the structure is a three-dimensional uh, molecular uh, structure. So a lot of similarities in, in odorants of very similar olfactory characteristics. Now if we take a look at some noxious odorants, here you can see uh, these noxious odorants are things that smell generally bad. And if you remember the example that I used before, I talked specifically about the smell of sulfur. And the so-called fart bombs that some of you may have played with as kids contain very strong sulfur compounds. And naturally, noxious odorants, especially those that come in from body odors, also contain those same sulfur compounds. Here, if you're taking a look at halitosis, the, the result of, of bad breath, you can see, again, a sulfur compound attached to our carbon. You can see our, our sulfurs and, again, more hydrocarbons that contain sulfur in them. If we take a look at flatulence, you can see again, same types of odorants that are present in those gases that we release. Underarm odor, again, more sulfur compounds and things that generally are noxious or not very appealing. Foot odor, again, same thing. So these typical little compounds are present and we don't, again, we don't need as much of that dissolved in the air to actually sense it, things that are present in very small concentrations of the air for our nose to be able to pick up on. Now let's take a look at how olfaction takes place in our anatomy. Now where the sensory receptors are located, where all the olfaction takes place, is actually within the superior portion of the nasal cavity, known as the olfactory epithelium. So here in this cross section, we can see the nose itself on our side view of the nose, we can see our nostril, and we can see how air travels through the nasal conche. And the whole purpose of these conche is to create turbulence that travels up to the olfactory epithelial plate. And in this, in this plate, you can see uh, the receptors that are located along with the olfactory bulb, which is going to carry the nerves that take its way over to the central nervous system. And looking at that, uh, as we zoomed in, we can see in from the olfactory epithelium, you can see the presence of the olfactory bulb as we mentioned and right that separates the olfactory epithelium from the nerves is the cribriform plate so this skull structure contains very small holes that allow these pro these neurons the sensory neurons present in the olfactory epithelium to project over to the neurons now looking at the olfactory epithelial cells here you can see the presence of our sensory neurons that are littered amongst the other epithelial cells now looking at the olfactory epithelial cells themselves, here you can see it's a little bit upside down where the basal cells that connect to the connective tissue, the, the desmosomes that anchor the epithelial cells connect to the basal cells under, and the uh, uh, basal lamina, the connective tissue just above. Now on the bottom side, typically would be known as the apical side, where we have the dendrites of the sensory neurons, those olfactory sensory neurons that are located right at the top next to the cilia. And that cilia helps move along this layer of mucus that's generated by the, some of the supporting cells, which we'll learn in the next slide over. Now that mucus allows for the, the dendrites to maintain their aqueous environment. And we're gonna find that as the air travels over, those odor molecules will bind to the mucus and get dissolved and picked up by these sensory neurons. So how big is this olfactory epithelial plate? It's really a one by one inch area that contains those epithelial cells that contain not only the sensory neurons but the basal cells as well as the other supporting neurons as well. Now what exactly is the olfactory receptor? Well in this case you can see as you saw in the structure from the uh, from from the slide prior you can see that these are actually bipolar neurons in that the dendrites terminate on the cell body and then we see the axon on the opposite side of the cell body projecting all the way over to the next order neuron the second order neurons so we contain many of the receptors again a one by one inch area for the olfactory epithelial cells contain almost 10 to 100 million of these receptors so many many of these receptors uh, with the purpose of being able to pick up the chemicals that are dissolved in, in the air as well as the chemicals dissolving into the mucus layer right below in the apical side of the epithelial cells.
Now the other cells that uh, su provide support are called supporting cells. And what they basically do, the same thing we saw are neuroglia. They come in and make sure that the neurons have adequate nutrition, have enough glucose. They also regulate the amount of nutrients surrounding to make sure that those cells maintain their function. And basal cells are located more on the basal side of the, of the olfactory epithelium. And what they do is anytime our sensory neurons start to break down, you see these stem cells will come in and regrow into olfactory receptors as time goes on. Additionally, what you're going to also be able to see are Bowman's glands. And the Bowman's glands are the ones that actually are exocrine epithelial cells. So these are exocrine epithelial cells embedded within the olfactory epithelium that produce mucus for the protection for the apical side of the columnar epithelial cells that you see. So how olfaction actually takes place? As I mentioned, the odorants that we saw in our prior slides, those odorants of which we have many different types and many uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of different odors that are present in the air in very, very small Small, very small concentrations will eventually bind to the receptors. So these receptors are, uh, in, in this case, will pick up those particular odorants and as they bind through they'll create this cascade which I'll describe in just a little bit. Now the odorants that bind to these receptors, these are ligands, another form of a ligand. Remember, a ligand is something that binds specifically to a receptor. Now, what we're gonna be able to see is the depolarization that takes place in this sensory neuron. That depolarization isn't caused initially by any voltage changes, they're not caused by any mechanical changes that are taking place. It literally is an odorant binding to the receptor. And so what we're gonna to have to do is we're going to be able to see proteins that are involved that will result in the increase of some signal that we'll learn in this slide as well as in other future slides is cyclic AMP, which is derived from ATP itself. So taking a look at how this works, the odorant binds to the receptor, and as that receptor becomes activated, it's going to trigger a G protein, which acts as a molecular switch. It's guanine nucleotide binding protein. It's a peripheral protein located on the inside of the cell that switches on another uh, enzyme called adenylate cyclase. And adenylate cyclase, the entire purpose of adenylate cyclase is taking ATP and converting that to cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP works on activating other channels. So here cyclic AMP binds to the sodium channels, and again this would be a ligand-gated channel, but the receptor is for cyclic AMP, it's located on the inside of the channel. Once that's activated, that allows sodium to rush in to create our graded potentials. And those graded potentials can start to sum up and travel down to the axon hillock of that bipolar sensory neuron and trigger action potentials once those are reached threshold. So this whole process in, that's taking place is a way for a molecule on the outside of the cell to trigger the activation of channels to result in depolarization and therefore action potentials to make its way over to our cerebral cortex. So once we actually generate the action potential, you can see that that impulse, that action potential impulse will travel down the olfactory nerves. Here we can see the olfactory epithelial cells, axons projecting through the cribriform plate and terminating on the uh, olfactory bulb. And within the olfactory bulb here you can see the olfactory tract and that will travel back over to the primary olfactory area on the temporal lobe. So what's interesting about this, here you can see the sensory neurons represent the first order neurons our next cells, our mitral cells, will be the second order neurons that travel down that olfactory nerve. This pathway doesn't involve the three order neurons. It's the only sensory system that has direct cortical projections without going through our relay station that we know is the thalamus. Keep that in mind when we compare all the different sensory pathways, that olfaction is the exception to it. So the first order neurons, again, are the olfactory receptors. The second order are the ones that are located in the olfactory bulb. And those axons project down to the primary olfactory area and completely bypass the thalamus itself. So what's interesting about uh, olfaction is that it has very rapid adaptation, meaning, as I mentioned earlier, that when exposed to a chronic stimulus, 
let's say, the presence of our odorants in the air. Over time, what's going to happen to these sensory neurons is that they're going to rapidly decrease the amount of action potentials that are sent over to the primary olfactory area in the temporal region. So how fast does it actually adapt to? Well, within the first second, you see a decrease by 50%. We have the amount of action potentials that are sent in. And within about one to two minutes, we completely no longer perceive that sense of smell because our neurons, even though they are still exposed to the odorant, are actually no longer triggering action potentials. So the purpose of this is to actually minimize the amount of perception for the odorants that we're constantly exposed to. Now think about where we would see this. Let's say you're sitting on a bus and uh, next to you is a lady or man with very heavy perfume. And what you notice is you could probably smell it from the second you walk onto the bus. But give yourself about a couple seconds and it doesn't smell as strong. Now, the sensory neurons are still firing the same way they did initially. Now, those sensory neurons are still receiving the odorant, but the number of action potentials that are generated by that neuron start to decrease. And after a couple minutes, you may notice you may not even smell it as strong as you did when you first smelled it. And probably within about two, three minutes, you don't really smell that anymore. Now, for you guys that have done anatomy and have had a cat dissection, I'm pretty sure you remember the smell of formaldehyde. And when you first walk into the room, you get blasted by the smell of formaldehyde. But after a couple minutes in the room, you probably don't smell it any longer. And again, that's due to the rapid adaptation of our olfactory pathways. Even though the sensory neurons can still be firing, what's happening is the, the pathways leading to the primary olfactory area have the reduced amount of action potentials that are sent in. Therefore, we don't really perceive the sense of smell, even though we're still exposed to the stimulus. Gustation, which is the sense of taste, follows the same type of stimulus in that these are a chemical that's not dissolved in air, but actually dissolved in water, in this case, uh, saliva. So our chemical stimulus in this case is called a taste stent, while for the olfaction, it's called an odorant. For gustation, it's called a taste stent, which is also going to follow the same molecular structure as we saw with our odorants. And these flavors are really a combination of the flavors that we can taste are a combination of the, the taste that I'll describe, along with olfactory, the sense of smell, as well as the sense of touch that's taking place on the tongue itself. So whenever we're eating something, and especially foodies that start to describe uh, the sense of smell that comes off with a certain particular food or drink, uh, that's also combined with the taste stints that are dissolved in the, in the food that reach the tongue receptors. And then it's the sense of touch. How does the feeling of the food traveling over the tongue feel as well? So those things are characteristically make up the flavors that are present in the things that we consume. Now, what exactly are the five primary tastes? It's sour, sweet, bitter, salty, and umami. Umami, which I'll describe in just a second. The regional areas of where you would typically experience these tastes are seen on the, the image to the right. Here you can see where things are typically sweet. You'll taste on the very tip of your tongue. Salty, also on the tip of your tongue. So if you ever eat uh, something that's way too salty and you eat too much of it, you may notice that the front of your tongue may feel, um, uh, well, you'll certainly feel the tip of your tongue after eating a lot of salty stuff. Now, things that are typically sour, you know, will be exhibited to the sides of your tongue. You can feel this whenever you uh, take a, a little sip of vinegar or you bite into a lime or lemon. The areas that are affected the most are things by your cheeks. Now, bitter is typically tasted on the very back of the tongue. Now, the last one of all, all of these is umami. And umami is a Japanese term that means meaty or savory. And it doesn't have a specific location, but people that, especially back then when they were studying the sense of taste, they described umami as uncharacteristically like unlike any of the other four primary tastes in that it doesn't have a specific location on the tongue and that it's not as sharp. It rolls over the tongue and, and it has a very different palatable characteristic than any other four primary tastes. So things that elicit umami uh, would be things such things that contain broths or any, any meat flavors to it. And so what's interesting about umami 
is that it's long lasting and can actually be very mouthwatering. So anything, anytime you have anything with, uh, with, with meat or brothy uh, has a tendency to coat the tongue and, and create this sensation. So one of the things that uh, was listed, and like I said, this is a Japanese term. So with the history of umami, there was a Japanese chemist back in the early 1900s named Kakune Ikeda. And I apologize if I completely botched his name, but for his, he was from the Tokyo Imperial University who was looking for a molecule, uh, the, the molecular structure of a taste that would result in the feeling of umami. And what he found about umami is that it was elicited by things that uh, contain seaweed. And fermented fishes and seaweed had this particular taste that he was able to characterize that really barely differed from sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. So what he did was he found that the seaweed contained uh, a, a glu glutamic acid, and it's one of the amino acids that we had mentioned previously uh, that elicited that umami taste. And so what he did was to take that glutamic acid and he wanted to be able to concentrate it. Now, I'm pretty certain he wouldn't have been able to just take a bunch of gl glutamic acid and dump it onto the tongue to result in this umami taste, because after all, it is, an it is an acid. So what he was able to do is take that glutamic acid and turn it in and, and mix it with an, uh, a metal of some sort uh, or another element to uh, create a salt. And so what Professor Ikeda did was he started to try different elements to bind to the glutamic acid to create something stable. So he tried calcium, he tried potassium, he tried ammonium, and what he noticed about that is that all of them elicited some metallic taste. So he had uh, calcium uh, glutamate, that was what he, what he tried first, and that tasted too metally. He tried potassium glutamate, and that also tasted very minerally. Uh, so these things didn't really, uh, even though they may have elicited the umami, uh, umami flavor, they weren't quite palatable. And so what he tried next was sodium. And so the sodium glutamate was the one that happened to be the most soluble and palatable. And he was able to crystallize it into a powder form. So his result is the formula for monosodium glutamate, also known as MSG. And he submitted a patent to produce this uh, chemical to elicit the feeling of umami. And so you may have seen MSG, it's uh, fairly prominent in Asian foods, of course, uh, as it was produced by Kakuna Ikeda. And he had the patent for quite some time, and so he sold it as another type of salt that very different uh, than the sodium chloride type salt that we're used to. And so this he created, uh, this MSG that uh, became very present in foods, was a, a welcome addition to many other foods to elicit that umami feeling. Taking a look at how gustation works, we would see the presence of taste buds. And so we have to take a look at the taste buds that are present on the tongue, the soft palate, uh, the pharynx, and the larynx itself, but most of them being concentrated within the tongue itself. Now, while we saw in our olfactory system, we saw about 10 to 100 million sensory receptors. Here we can see about 10,000 taste buds with about 50 gustatory receptor cells located in each taste bud. So technically, we really only have about half a million receptors that are completely responsible for, for the sense of taste. So looking at the two, whether if you were to take a look at olfactory's 100 million receptors versus gustatory's 500,000 receptors, it's clearly evident that olfactory uh, reception is much stronger than gustatory. So within the taste buds itself, uh, you can see the in the taste bud, you can see the presence of our gustatory receptor cells. And these are uh, all located within the taste bud itself. And you can see the way it's formed in our uh, electron microscope that we can see, where each of these little buds right here are the gustatory hairs that are that lie on top of the taste bud itself. So from here you can see the gustatory receptor cells located all through the, the taste bud itself. You can see the receptor cells, you can see the supporting cells, again for these particular epithelial cells, and then you can see the same basal cells that will differentiate into gustatory receptor cells or the uh, supporting cells if any of those cells are damaged. Now 
Keep in mind that these gustatory receptor cells are not exactly sensory neurons. In fact, they have become modified neuroepithelial cells. So they're a combination of neuron and epithelial cells that, that innervate the first order neurons. And here you can see the neurons dendrites located below. So the gustatory receptor cell is not the first order neuron. It's actually the thing that contributes the uh, stimulation of the first order neurons. So these uh, cells are receptors, contain receptors along with the surrounding cells, and, and eventually will be able to pick up the taste ends that are dissolved in, um, along the tongue. So what's interesting about that? So I mentioned 500,000 gustatory receptor cells. What's interesting about with that, that takes place with age is that we actually start to lose the number of taste buds associated with age. It's not uncommon for uh, elderly people to need to increase the amount of salt or increase the amount of sugar in order to elicit the same taste that they remember. So when you look at the diet of, of the elderly, typically will have a tendency to use a lot more salt or maybe actually more prone to eat sweeter things to elicit the, the feeling of sweet. So whenever you look at your grandma's candy dish and you see it going through fairly quickly, you kind of understand why. Her sweet receptors are not as prevalent as those of younger. What's also interesting about younger, especially children, is they actually contain more taste buds. And you'll be able to see where those taste buds are located on the later slide. But children have a much heightened sense of gustation. So the particular foods that kids ate when they were younger may be completely averse to back then, but as time went on, they tried a particular food again later on, and it doesn't taste as bad, may not taste as strong as when they did when they were a kid. So when we zoom in into that taste, uh, taste pore, you can see that the hairs that are on top of the gustatory receptors are called a gustatory hair, and it's uh, present. Here you can see the taste bud, you can see the taste pore of which we have the gustatory cells all oriented in the way that you can see on the image on the top right. And so as uh, at the very top you can see in gray is the saliva that coats the tongue itself and within that saliva you would have the taste dents that are dissolved within it. Within it. So as a taste dent starts to brush through the taste pore that will generate uh, the uh, uh, stimulus transduction that we'll describe later on. Uh, when we look at the gustatory receptors, they don't last forever. In fact, they last about 10 days. So if you can think about a situation where, let's say, one day you want to eat pizza and you, you hastily grab a slice and bite into, and you find that the hot pizza sauce ends up singeing your tongue. And you may notice, yeah, you'll feel the pain initially, but what happens is all of a sudden you might notice that you might not be able to taste food as well. And that's because you've probably killed off the taste, uh, the uh, gustatory receptors that are located. So maybe your taste buds are a little singed and now your sense of taste has diminished quite a bit. But what you notice after about a week, the, your sense of taste starts to come back. And that's because our gustatory receptors, those basal cells that are present, start to differentiate back into our gustatory cells to restore our sense of taste. So where are the taste buds located exactly? Well, they're located within what are called papillae. And these are elevations on the tongue um, that include touch receptors to uh, not only be able to palpate or feel the food, but also to taste it. These taste buds that are found in the papillae are present all throughout the tongue in different areas. Now, I'm not gonna require you to remember which papillae are located where, and which ones uh, will contain the most taste buds. But the, the whole sense of taste involves that of touch along with uh, taste sense that are picked up by the gustatory cells. And again, the sense of olfaction in order to trigger the entire process of taste. So those all contribute. Uh, the valate papillae are the ones that uh, contain about 100 to 300 taste buds each, and they're located towards the very back of the tongue. These are the bigger papillae that you can see. And if you ever stick out your tongue really far enough, you can see them right at the very back row. Now, the fungiform uh, is pretty much the one that's spread all the way out throughout the entire tongue itself. So these contain about five taste buds each. Now, the foliate papilla, which are located on the sides, are the ones uh, that are consistent with the cheek itself. And these are things that are 
uh, no longer present after childhoods. And these contain the most densest uh, taste buds that are lost with, with age. Now the filiform ones are the ones located uh, up towards the front, and they're also in, uh, responsible for, for sensing that tactile, the sense of touch that's associated with food. And uh, they actually don't contain any taste buds at all, but is really responsible for moving food left and right in order to contribute to the mechanical digestion that takes place in uh, the mouth itself. Now with the sensory transduction, you can see that gustation starts with the presence of a tastent, and that tastent has to bind to our gustatory receptor cells in order to trigger the receptor potentials that are gonna be generated. All of them involve some sort of ion movement depending on the primary taste. Now salts enter the, uh, the gustatory receptor cells by entering directly into the receptor cell, resulting in depolarization. Now anything that involves sour involves acids, hydrogen protons, and those travel to through the receptors, triggering depolarization from taking place. So salts are sodium, sour is through protons moving into the uh, receptor cells, bitter and sweet tastings typically block potassium channels, leaving the cell in a more depolarized state. So with this whole depolarization is going to result in calcium uptake that will take place in those gustatory cells. So these neurotransmitters that are released by these gustatory cells will end up triggering our first order neurons. So again, the gustatory receptor cells are not the first order neurons. They release these neurotransmitters that will be picked up by our first order neurons that are located just like I mentioned earlier, just below the receptor cells themselves. So the taste buds themselves, or the receptor cells that are located, you'll see that there's gonna be three neurons that are traveling back over to the central nervous system. And here you can see uh, the first order neurons that, that start uh, will travel to our intended destination. So the facial nerve is going to be the first one that innervates the front of the tongue itself. You'll see the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the, that cover the uh, papillae towards the back that travel back. And then the ones that, uh, the taste buds that are located in the tonsils as well as the throat and epiglottis travel up the vagus nerve. So all of this is carrying afferent sensory information from the gustatory receptor cells to the first order neurons and will travel down the rest of the gustation pathway. So all of those will converge. Those same pathways that we saw earlier will travel to the gustatory nucleus of the medulla oblongata. This area is a nucle uh, nucleated area of the, uh, the medulla oblongata that have the cell bodies for the second order neurons. So those axons, those first order neurons converge onto the gustatory nucleus and uh, actually do not cross over. First order neurons terminate onto the second order neurons, and that projects all the way to the thalamus. Now from the thalamus, that's gonna contain the cell bodies for the third order neurons that will converge into the primary gustatory area of the cerebral cortex. Okay, and you can see that on the image on the top right. And when we resect, you can see it's more on the inside. Now when we look at the threshold for taste, again, this is all related to adaptation. And we will see that the threshold for taste depends on the primary taste itself. And this, we can see we have the highest sensitivity to bitter tastings. Bitter tastings have typically a higher sensitivity, meaning we don't need as much uh, bitter to be able to sense that being sent. Now sour tastings typically exhibit a medium sensitivity, meaning we only need uh, we need a little bit more sour to be able to elicit an actual potential that's perceived in the central nervous system. Salty and sweet tastings typically exhibit low sensitivity, meaning we need higher amounts to be able to elicit that feeling. So typically these things take place within the first five minutes of being continuously exposed to that taste stint. Our next stop in discussing our special senses is vision, which we're gonna be looking at the sensation as well as the perception of electromagnetic radiation. Now our eyes are especially tuned to photons of electromagnetic radiation at wavelengths between 400 to 700 nanometers in length. And this corresponds to different visible colors within that spectrum. Looking at the structure of the eye, 
You'll notice the eye is structured within three different layers, our fibrous, vascular, and nervous tunic. The outer layer consists of the sclera and the cornea, where the sclera represents the white of the eye, and the cornea represents the transparent epithelium that protects the front of the eye itself. This is where we're gonna be able to see that light is able to pass through in order to focus in the special sensory areas of the eye itself, which we'll discuss soon. The middle represents the vascular tunic, which is gonna contain the choroid, as well as the ciliary body and the iris. The inner layer represents the nervous tunic, which is gonna contain the retina, which is gonna contain the photosensitive cells that will be able to be attuned to that electromagnetic radiation. What you'll also notice that these three layers are consistent with that of the meninges that we saw that surround the brain itself. Now focusing on the vascular tunic, the middle layer, you'll see that the ciliary body consists of two parts. We have the ciliary processes, as well as the ciliary muscle, of which the ciliary processes were comprised of folded epithelial tissue that secrete aqueous humor. The ciliary muscle attaches to the lens itself, and this allows the lens to be able to adapt to near and far vision, a concept that we'll explore on later slides. Now the iris is gonna represent the colored portion of the eye that's gonna consist of both circular and radial smooth muscle fibers. Both the circular and radial smooth muscles will allow the iris to dilate or constrict to adjust the amount of light entering the eye. The image to the bottom right shows you what the iris looks like from the back. Here you can see the ciliary processes that extend, as well as the iris containing the pigmented tissue that will contain those circular and radial smooth muscle fibers. This cross-section of the eye will allow you to be able to view the three layers along with the iris and the lens. Now to the left of the image, you can see the sclera that is going to contain the white of the eyes and the cornea that is transparent that allows light to enter into the eye itself. Here you can see a separation between the vitreous chamber and the anterior chamber, which is going to contain two different fluids, which we'll discuss later. The iris will contain pigmented tissue that will also retract or expand to allow dilation or constriction of the eye to adjust the amount of light entering. Now the ciliary processes and the ciliary muscle attach to the lens. Here you can see the zonular fibers that attach to the lens that allow for a concept called accommodation. Now the ciliary processes, part of the ciliary body, will secrete the aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor is going to be the fluid that flows throughout uh, the lens, as well as the anterior chamber and drains back onto the venous system. Now the arrows in this image depict the direction of the aqueous humor flowing through the eye. So the ciliary processes will, will release aqueous humor that will flow right underneath the iris above the lens, flow out into the anterior chamber, over the iris, and drain out into the scleral venous sinus, which will allow drainage into the ciliary vein to enter back into the circulatory system. Another noteworthy feature is the lens. And here, we met, as we mentioned earlier, the lens is going to allow light to enter through. And we will be able to see accommodation of the lens to adjust the light flowing in. Now the lens is avascular, meaning it doesn't contain any capillaries to allow blood to flow into. Now onto the inner layer of the eye, the nervous tunic, which is gonna contain the retina, which will contain the photoreceptors that will be attuned to the electromagnetic radiation. Now the retina lines up the posterior two thirds of the eye. This is the back of the eye that only needs the retina simply because the light only strikes at the very back of the eye. So if I can go back to an earlier image, the retina would be located at the back portion. As light enters through the sclera, focuses in through the iris, in between the lens, the light strikes the very back of the eye where the retina needs to be located. Now what is characteristic about the retina is that it is pigmented by melanin, which is produced by melanocytes. And that allows the retina to be dark, to absorb the light rather than to scatter the light. Now albinos, on the other hand, do not have melanin. 
or lack the production of melanocytes to produce that melanin, and therefore their retinas will not be pigmented. Typically those that lack melanin will not be able to absorb the light as efficiently. Therefore, their light appears scattered in their eyes and would typically need to wear dark sunglasses in order to filter out the light. Now the way the light strikes the eye, where the central focus of all that light would be, is in an area called the macula lutea, which is the center of the retina. The area that creates the intense focus of the light is the fovea centralis. This is the area where there are no rods or nerve cells and where we see the highest concentration of cones, the photoreceptors that we'll discuss later, that allows us to see in color. The presence of all cones in that area lends itself to sharp central vision. It's the area of central focus so that whatever image we look at, whatever we focus on will always be adjusted in the fovea centralis. This gives us the sharpest vision for whatever we're trying to focus on and we consistently move our eyes in order to focus that fovea centralis onto that object of focus. Another concept that we'll discuss later is that while whatever we're focused on is in sharp color, areas in our peripheral vision will be mostly rods and that area will have less cones and more rods, therefore objects in our periphery will have less color and less focus than that of the fovea centralis. Now the image from the bottom right is our ophthalmoscope, which allows direct inspection of the retinal vessels for any pathological changes. These are things that are offered by your optometrist that give us the ability to view into the body where you can see arterial vessels as well as the capillaries without actually opening into the body itself. These images allow us to see the effect of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension. We can see areas of the fovea centralis as well as the optic disc, which we'll explain later on, offers a clinical diagnostic tool to determine the health of the retina. Now the optic disc on the retina is the area where the optic nerve and the retinal vessels merge together. And this area lacks any cones or rods, any of the photoreceptors that are attuned to color or black and white vision. So this area consists of a blind spot in which, in which any light that focuses on the optic disc will result in a blind spot. The area of the retina that does not receive any photon stimulus. On the previous slide, you can see where the optic disc is. And that area is to the left of the ophthalmoscope. And you'll notice that this area, the optic disc, is bright. While the fovea centralis is dark. So this represents areas that light absorbs into. The dark areas, this rep represents the lack of reflection of light back into the ophthalmoscope, and the optic disc represents light being reflected. So areas that are darker represents areas that where we absorb the most light into the retina, and areas that are light, such as the optic disc, represent areas where light is refracted back into the ophthalmoscope. In other words, the fovea centralis is an area that can receive the most light for photoreception, and the optic disc is an area that has no photoreception. Now the blind spot occurs in each eye. However, with having both bilateral vision as well as saccadic movements, these are involuntary quick muscle motions that take place with the eye, allow for our brain to correct for this blind spot. Simply put, the presence of both eyes allows us to correct for the missing blind spot in one eye with that of the other eye. Now we can replicate this blind spot by this exercise. And in this image, what you see is a cross in the middle, an object to the right, and an object to the left. Now the object to the right is a circle, while the object to the left is a dashed line. Now what I'd like you to do is to look at this image, and I'd like you to see if you can expand this screen so that you can see it in full resolution. Now what I'll have you do is cover your left eye and keep your right eye on the cross. Now make sure that it always stays focused on that cross and move your head back and forth to the screen very slowly in order to make that O disappear. And you'll get to the point that your eye, specifically the fovea centralis, will be focused on that plus sign. And as long as you keep your right eye focused on it, that fovea centralis will always be lined up.
Now you'll get to the point where that O will eventually line up with the optic disc. As long as you move your head right to that point, when you see that O disappear, that O resides within that optic disc. And because you're covering your left eye, your left eye cannot correct for that missing blind spot. Now let's try the other side. Cover your right eye and stare at your cross with the left eye. And again, move your head back and forth slowly up until the point that your left eye lines up with the optic disc on your left eye. Eventually what's going to happen is you're going to notice that that dashed line is going to look fully complete. Now what your brain is doing is it's filling in what it's expecting to see. Your brain is expecting to see a full line. However, because that optic disc is right in that area, your brain fills in missing information. So what you should see once that dashed line is on your optic disc of your left eye is you should see a straight line. Now, if you uncover both eyes and you try and repeat this exercise, your opposite eye will correct for that missing blind spot. And therefore, this shouldn't work. Now, onto the photoreceptors. These receptors are cells that are attuned to that electromagnetic radiation. Just like we learned our gustatory receptor cells are attuned to taste dense, our olfactory receptor cells are attuned to odorants, our photoreceptors are attuned to electromagnetic radiation. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our cones are found more in the areas of the fovea centralis that gives us the sharpest vision. And cones typically will be able to, which we'll learn uh, later on, cones are attuned to three different types of colors, red, green, and blue. They offer the sharpest vision. Now looking at our rod-shaped photoreceptors, these receptors are adapted for low light threshold, meaning they're very sensitive to light. And what our rods do is that they produce low resolution black and white images. The rods actually help us see in the dark and offer vision in low light, but unfortunately are not as sharp as our cones. In the dark, our vision is mainly grayscale, meaning we can really only distinguish between grays, black, and white. So test this out sometime. With minimal light in your room, take a look around. Do you notice sharp color vision? No. In fact, you'll just see things are mainly black and white. But due to the low light threshold, this gives us the ability to be able to see in the dark. Now, what happens if you're in that dark room and you flip on the light, all of a sudden you see bright colors. And that's due to the cones, which we'll explore on the next slide over. Turn the lights back off and you'll notice that your vision will be dark. And eventually, your rod-shaped photoreceptors will be attuned to that, to whatever light is present in the room due to the low light threshold. What's also prominent with aging is that as we age, we lose our rods over time. Each eye contains about 120 million of these rod-shaped photoreceptors that starts to decrease with age. And that makes it difficult for those that are elderly to be able to drive at night due to the lack of those high-sensitive photoreceptors. Now our cone-shaped photoreceptors function in bright light. Just like that example I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, with a brightly lit room, we can see vivid images in color. And that's due to our cone-shaped photoreceptors. These photoreceptors allow us to have high resolution color images that we can see. And again, our cones are mostly prominent in the fovea centralis, right in the center of our vision. The three types of photoreceptors for cones that we'll be able to see will have three different pigments, which allow us to see in red, green, and blue. Now a complete loss of cones will result in legal blindness, while a relative loss or a deficiency of one type will result in color blindness, which we'll see on the next slide over. Now one thing I want to also point out is the way light enters into the eye. Here you saw our cones, prior you saw our rods, in which we can see the areas that are going to be the outer segment as well as the inner segment. So the outer segment are gonna contain the photoreceptive pigmentation, while the inner segment is gonna contain the bulk of the cell itself, mainly the nucleus, the organelles, and cytoplasm, as well as the axon and the axon terminals.
Now looking at the orientation of the photoreceptors, here you can see the epithelial cells. Technically, this is the outermost layer of the retina. Now if I go back to an earlier image, here you can see that pigmentation of the retina. You can see the embedded rods and cones. Here you can see light traveling through the vitreous humor, through our capillaries, through the arteries and veins, into all the nerves. And these nerves are our second order neurons that travel from the photoreceptors. We're going to pass through, let me just zoom in a little bit more. You can see that the light is now gonna travel first into the axon terminals, through the axon, through the cell bodies, all within the inner segment, and then reach the photoreceptive pigments in the outer segments before they reach the end of the pigmented epithelial cells. So technically, the direction of the action potential will move from the outer segment to the inner segment, which is opposite to that of the light direction. Now in this slide, you probably have seen these before. These are what are called Ishihara plates. And what they do is they test for color blindness. And here you can see on these plates, you'll see a multitude of colors embedded within those plates. The most common type of color blindness is red-green colorblind in which people that have this color blindedness cannot differentiate between red and green. So those that are red and green color blind will not be able to see the eight in the middle of the top left image. Those that have mild red green color blindedness would be able to see only a three. Now in order to distinguish red color blindedness, you can see the image to the right. And those that have normal red vision can see clearly the number 42. Those that have Complete red blindedness cannot see anything at all. All they would see is a red dotted plate. Those with mild red blindedness would only be able to see a faint two in the image. Now the bottom three images of our fruit basket shows us, at least to the left image, what it looks like to have normal vision. Here you can be able to discern clearly the oranges, the reds, as well as the green and the blues present those that have no green pigmentation cannot perceive any differences in the red and the green. So therefore, their image just shows us mostly yellows and greens. Now the image to the bottom right cannot differentiate between blue and yellow. So therefore, most of these that they're gonna be able to see are gonna be displayed in red. As we mentioned, visual stimuli are projected onto the back of the retina where the image appears as seen on the image to the bottom right, upside down. So what we see in front of us is sensed as upside down by the eye. Now visual perception that takes place in the brain will flip the image right side up. This experiment has been performed in the 1890s by a psychologist named George M. Stratton, who conducted experiments to test the theory of perceptual adaptation. In other words, do we really flip the image upside down in our brains? So he concocted this experiment with a helmet with an attached mirror to the lenses that he was wearing. So when he wore these glasses, images would be appearing upside down. In order to test if perception corrects the images he viewed, he wore the glasses, these reversing glasses for about 21 and a half hours over three days. And what he noted, that there was no changes in his vision, meaning, that he always perceived every time he wore those glasses, he perceived images to be upside down and there was no correction by the brain to flip the image right side up. After he removed the glasses, he noted that normal vision was restored instantaneously and without any disturbance or in the natural appearance of the position of objects. Now, the next thing he did was what would happen if he wore the glasses much longer? So this experiment, he wore the glasses for eight straight days. And what he noticed is that the first four days, the images that he was viewing were still upside down. What he noticed by day five upon waking up, he noticed that images were flipped right side back up and would not flip upside down unless he really focused and concentrated on the object that he was looking at. Then it became inverted again. So in order for him to concentrate on his vision, that's where he knew that the sensation of the images that were initially upside down and then flipped upside down by the mirror were sensed and then perceiving was correcting what he initially saw. 
by having to concentrate on his vision to turn it upside down again, especially when he knew the images were hitting his retinas in the opposite orientation as normal, Stratton deduced that his brain had reprocessed his vision and adapted to the changes in vision. So essentially what happens is that it took four days for his brain to correct the images and that appeared normal to him until he really focused on what he was viewing and then it corrected back to its original upside down orientation as those glasses were geared to do. Now this image is taken from the lilac chaser test which was performed by Jerry Hinton in 2005 and what Jerry Hinton wanted to prove is that the images that we view and the way we can view this image is by taking both of our eyes and focusing on the cross in the middle. That perception of movement takes place when we focus our eyes on the cross. What would appear when we're viewing the cross is the purple dots lining up and moving around in a clockwise fashion. But technically what's really happening is that only the dots are appearing and disappearing. If you really pay attention and follow those dots, you'll notice that the purple dots disappear and reappear in sequential order, giving the appearance of movement. What we perceive as movement is really only these purple dots appearing and disappearing. What we notice in that perception of movement, as those dots are disappearing and reappearing, what actually ends up is our brain filling in the missing hole with green in anticipation of this missing stimulus. Therefore, we see green, which is the negative color of purple. Take note as you stare at the cross, the holes that end up disappearing where the purple disc used to be, now fills in due to perception, fills in with their brain correcting in with that missing hole. Now keep staring, and after about 20-30 seconds, you'll notice that the lilac discs start to disappear over time. This is a, a phenomenon called Troxler fading, where the purple discs, which are blurry, start to disappear when focusing on that cross. So now all you should see at that point in time is that the purple discs start to disappear and only the green dots again appear. Keep in mind, nothing has changed about this test. The visual stimuli that you see are the purple discs fading in and out, giving us the perception of movement. And lastly, we see that the purple discs start to disappear because these blurry images are not perceived as important. The blurry images start to disappear when we focus our fovea centralis directly on the cross. Now, how does this appear in real life? Anything that appears blurry is not perceived. We, whatever we focus our eyes on will focus the fovea centralis, and anything in the periphery that is blurry and unfocused will actually no longer be perceived by the brain. All that blurry images are considered non-essential information and is therefore removed from our brain's perception. The next topic is convergence, which is the movement of both of our eyes. And convergence is the inward movement of the eyes so that both the focal points of our eyes are directed at the object right in the middle. This can be easily mimicked by the cross eye movement as we focus on an object that moves closer and closer to us. So the nearer the object, the greater the degree of convergence where we use the medial muscles to bring both eyes rotating to the midline to focus on the object. This convergence allows us to maintain our binocular vision and allow for depth perception. One way to demonstrate this convergence is to close one eye and then the other in succession, back and forth. And what you'll notice is that the image is slightly different from our left to our right side. That slight difference, that convergence of that information, allows us to perceive depth, which is important for us to be able to perceive images that are much further away than other objects. The next topic explores the concept behind nearsightedness and farsightedness, which is myopia and hyperopia, respectively. Now, these involve dysfunction of the focus of the images onto the back of the retina. In nearsightedness, only close objects can be seen clearly. These are people that can only view objects close up, but can't view more distant objects. The experience for those that have myopia is that objects further away seem much more blurrier. And so in order to correct the images uh, for those with myopia, require a concave lens, which you'll be able to visualize on the next slide over. 
Now hyperopia is the exact opposite, where only distant objects can be seen, but any nearby objects appear to be blurry. In order to correct this, it involves the use of a convex lens. Both myopia and hyperopia are usually a result of a misshapen eyeball. It's not an actual issue of the cornea or the lens itself. It's actually the length of the eyeball. And you can see that in the cross section over to the right. Either it's either too long or too short, which is going to affect the focal point for any images that travel through the cornea, through the lens, onto the back of the retina. So therefore, in order to correct the images, we usually use lenses, which are used in glasses or contacts, in order to correctly focus that object back onto the retina. Here in the image to the right, you can see what a normal eye is supposed to do. Any distant objects travel in parallel rays, are accommodated by the lens to focus the image onto the back of the retina. However, with myopia, with an elongated eyeball, parallel rays from distant objects will be focused way too short prior to where the retina is supposed to be, and therefore objects appear blurry. Now, hyperopia, you'll notice that the focal point of our images is further back than where the retina is. And so this typically see you would see a shorter length of the eyeball, and the only way to correct that is to use a lens that will refocus that image back onto where the actual retina is instead of the true focal point of our natural lens. The other term is presbyopia, which is the stiffening of the lens in a normal eyeball. And this does not allow the lens to expand when the ciliary muscles relax. So due to that inability for the lens to accommodate with near vision, the lens isn't fully compliant, meaning that it's not as stretchy and essentially what happens is objects become out of focus. Hence why older people, typically over the age of 40, would need reading glasses or corrective lenses in order to refocus that image due to the lack of accommodation of the lens. Now that we've discussed the focusing of the images onto the back of the retina, let's talk about how visual transduction takes place. The light waves focused onto the retina, we have to talk about how photons are sensed and transduced into action potentials. All this takes place with the help of the photopigments inside the photoreceptors that become excited in order to transduce that signal into visual perception. Now the photopigment in rods are called rhodopsin, while the photopigments in cones are called photopsin. So here you can see the different terms in opsin, which represent the photopigment, rods for rhodopsin, and cones for photopsin. Now we have three different types of cone photopigments which we see red, green, and blue. And the different colors that we are able to see all depend on the various amounts of stimulation of the three cone photopigments. In the next slide, we can see how the first step in visual transduction takes place. Now the first step in visual transduction is the absorption of the light by the photopigment in the outer segment of that photoreceptor. Once that photopigment absorbs the light, we'll see a structural change that occurs. And you can see that taking place on the image to the bottom right. Here you see light being absorbed of the photopigment, and what takes place is the conformational change of that photopigment contained. Once that photopigment is structurally altered, that's gonna result in the depolarization of the photoreceptor, which will send an action potential over to the central nervous system. If we take a look at the components of the photopigments, you'll note that there's two different parts. The opsin, which is a glycoprotein, of which we have four different types for the photopigment, and then retinol, which is a derivative of vitamin A, which we know is beta carotene. This retinol molecule is the light absorbing portion of that photopigment. The term that I described earlier, which is the structural changes taking place on that retinal molecule is a concept called bleaching, which is that conformational change that results in response to light. The next concept we'll talk about is light adaptation and dark adaptation. What happens when we turn off the lights? How do our eyes respond? And what happens when we flip on the lights? How do we respond to that change in light? And all of this is related to how the photopigments of both the cones and rods respond to different changes in light settings. Now light adaptation is moving from the dark condition to the light condition. So picture yourself in a dark room and we flip on the switch. And what happens is we adapt to the change very quickly. 
and this is due to the cones this is due to the cones activating due to that amount of light coming in so the photopigment in cones have a tendency to regenerate very quickly typically within about 90 seconds where half of the cone photopigments are ready to fire cones are much more highly sensitive to light and therefore regenerate faster than our rods now for dark adaptation this is going from light to dark typically takes minutes to occur and this situation can best be illustrated by being in a light room and turning off the lights and what you'll note is that it may take a couple minutes for you to be able to adapt to be able to see anything and as i mentioned earlier in the dark once we fully adapted the only photoreceptors that are working are our rods and the rods have a tendency to regenerate their photopigment very slowly hence why it takes time in order to adapt fully to the dark. How long does it take for our rods to regenerate the rhodopsin? Approximately five minutes for half of the rhodopsin. In order for full regeneration, it takes about 30 minutes. And this explains night vision as to rods being much more sensitive in the dark while rods are much more sensitive to light than cones are. During the night, we have a tendency to see not in color, but in black and white. What takes place in darkness after about 30 minutes any brief visual stimuli will stimulate the rods due to their higher sensitivity and will be perceived in black and white now the key thing about all of our photoreceptors is that these photoreceptors both cones and rods are inhibitory and they release glutamate our photoreceptors innervate bipolar cells now with photoreceptors always partially depolarized meaning that they are firing inhibitory neurotransmitters to inhibit the bipolar cell. Now the bipolar cells are not sending any action potentials over to the brain due to the inhibition of those photoreceptors. Now therefore, if there's no impulse being sent to the brain, there is no image being perceived. Now in light, what takes place is that the pigment, both our rhodopsin and our cone photopigments activate enzymes that close those sodium channels. And the closure of those sodium channels ends up hyperpolarizing the photoreceptors. Now that the bipolar cells are no longer inhibited by those photoreceptors, an action potential can be generated and sent as a nerve impulse all the way back to the brain to perceive an image. Now to sum up this slide, what happens again in darkness is that the neurotransmitter glutamate is released and therefore keeping our sodium channels open and inhibiting the bipolar cell. This inflow of sodium is called the dark current. And what happens when photons from light come in, those, those photons cause, and what, hap, and what happens when photons from light come in, those cause sodium channels to close, and then the rod hyperpolarizes. Now that hyperpolarization of that photoreceptor due to the closing of those sodium channels results in the stopping of an action potential. Now overall, it's strange to think that when your eyes are closed or when you're asleep or when you're in a dark room are when your rods are most electrically active. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the visual pathway describes the pathway of the actual potentials as they move from cell to cell over to the optic nerve back to the occipital lobe. Now the graded potentials that take place occur at the very back of the retina. So to the image to the right, here you can see where light enters in from left to right. We'll have to pass through the nerve fibers, our ganglion cells, our bipolar cells, and lastly, the photoreceptors before reaching the pigmented layer of the retina. The pathway of the transduced signal from the photoreceptors over to the bipolar cells will converge those signals onto the bipolar cells, which will converge even more from the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells onto the optic nerve. This convergence essentially is the funneling of any action potentials to the optic nerve. So as I mentioned previously, when the photoreceptors are stimulated, inhibitory signals are sent over to the bipolar cells. And inhibition of the bipolar cells results in the stopping of action potentials. Now what's happening in light is that excitation of the photopigments stops the production of glutamate, therefore no longer inhibiting the bipolar cells. The bipolar cells can now send their action potentials over to the ganglion cells and send those action potentials over to the optic nerve. And remember, at night, when there are no photons, 
our photoreceptors are constantly depolarized, sending that inhibitory signal inhibiting the bipolar cells. Therefore, no action potentials are being sent over to the occipital lobe. Now, what you see here are the different rods and cones. Rods have a tendency to converge more information into the bipolar cells, into the ganglion cells, while the cones exhibit less convergence. Therefore, the cones contribute to a greater visual acuity due to that less convergence that's taking place in these pathways. Now that those signals converge onto the optic nerve, those axons travel all the way back towards towards the optic chiasm where crossing over takes place. Here in this image to the bottom right, here you can see all the projecting axons that travel down the optic nerve and move over to the optic chiasm that you can see on the next slide over. Now what we've been learning in our peripheral nervous system is that projected axons cross over to the other side. Now this isn't completely true for the visual pathway where only some of the axons travel to the other side, while some stay on the ipsilateral side. So therefore, what we see is incomplete crossing through the optic chiasm. Now let's take a look at the image on the right. Here we can see the left brain, and we can see the right brain, and we can see partial crossing over taking place on the optic chiasm. Here we see our left eye and our right eye, and things that are seen in the visual field on the left eye and the visual field on the right eye, giving us binocular vision. Now any objects on the left side of our visual field will be projected onto the right portion of the retina of both the left and the right eye. Information from the right side of the retina of the left eye will cross over to the right side of the brain, while anything that is projected onto the right side of the right eye will remain on the ipsilateral side. Now any objects to the right side, you can see, will project onto the left side of both eyes, where objects projected onto the right eye will cross through the optic chiasm. Any objects on the right field that are projected onto the left eye will stay on the ipsilateral side as well. This next slide will show you this partial decusation that's taking place at the optic chiasm. Any images projected from the left visual field onto the right side of the retina, here illustrated in blue, will cross over to the right side of the primary visual cortex. Any images from our right visual field are projected onto the left side of the retina and will be projected down to the left side of the visual cortex. Now the last structure that we're going to be talking about in our sensory lecture is the ear, which is going to serve two functions. One, audition, which is the process of hearing, and number two, equilibrium and balance in the semicircular canals. Now the sensory modality that's involved is still electromagnetic radiation, yet much less energy than light. These are going to be vibratory signals that are going to be able to be perceived and transduced into electrical signals over to the central nervous system. Looking at the structure of the ear, the ear has three different regions, the external ear, the middle ear, and the internal ear. The focus of what we're gonna be looking at is the middle ear as well as the internal ear. The external ear is gonna contain the flap that we can visually see, which is the ear, the ear canal, and then the middle ear is going to involve the three smallest bones in the human body, which are gonna be used to transduce those vibratory signals into the inner ear. The internal ear is where we're going to be able to see the action potentials that are generated as a result of those vibration and transduce trend those vibrations as well as balance information over to the central nervous system. Looking at the middle ear in between the external and the internal ear is going to be an air-filled cavity within the temporal bone. And here you can see three auditory bones called ossicles called the stapes, incus, and then the malleus. Now the quick summary of what's taking place is that any vibration that's sent in and channeled in through the external ear, down the canal, into the tympanic membrane will cause vibrations that are transduced into the malleus, the incus, and over to the stapes. The stapes is going to cover the oval window, which is going to start the opening of the pathway to an internal fluid-filled area for the internal ear.
So within the middle ear, that vibration signals that are sent through the air are going to get transduced into fluid changes in the internal ear. Now within the internal ear, we're going to be able to see a labyrinth. And within that labyrinth, we're going to be able to see three different areas, the semicircular canals, the vestibule, as well as the cochlea. But for audition, the only thing that's going to be involved is the cochlea, which is located anterior to the vestibule. The vestibule will be used for static equilibrium in order to determine our position in space, and the semicircular canals will be used for dynamic equilibrium to measure changes in our position in space. Now looking at the cochlea, we're going to be able to see two different types of fluid contained within this spiral shape structure. We'll see paralymph and endolymph, which is going to help fill these three different channels which is going to be the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and the cochlear duct. Here we can see a cross-section of one section of the cochlea. And remember, this is going to completely spiral around like you see in this prior image. Now this slide describes the process taking place with the movement of this paralymph, which is going to be transduced into the two different canals that we'll talk about, the scalae vestibuli and the scalae tympani. As the paralymph moves through both canals, that's going to cause the endolymph within the cochlear duct to vibrate. So let's take a look at how that takes place on the next slide over. The vibration of sound waves that will rock the tympanic membrane, which will cause the incus the malleus, and stapes to transduce those vibrations against the oval window. Now vibrations at the oval window will cause pressure waves of that paralymph that will be sent down the vestibular canal, or the scalae vestibuli as I mentioned in a previous slide. Once it makes it over to the very end of the cochlea, it will route back down and around down through the tympanic canal, or the scalae tympani as I mentioned on the last slide. Now the areas that will vibrate in the cochlea, and here you can see the cochlea is all straightened out, but the reality is it's in that spiral shape that I showed you on the prior slide. Now areas of the membrane in between the paralymph, called the basilar membrane, will vibrate at the different frequencies of the vibrations taking place, and that will allow the transduction of different areas that will result in different pitches that are perceived by the brain. Now what we're going to do on the next slide over is we're going to zoom in into the organ of corti where we can see the basilar membrane vibrating at those different frequencies that we hear. Within the basilar membrane, again on top of the scalae tympani, the basilar membrane will be the anchor for the supporting cells supporting the outer hair cells. The outer hair cells are the ones that will receive the vibration as a result of the paralymph vibrating and will transduce that mechanical vibration into electrical signals along the tectorial membrane. Those signals will send out and project over to the vestibulocochlear nerve, also known as cranial nerve 8, over to the central nervous system. Now this entire pathway shows you the transduction of those vibrations from air all the way to fluid. Sound waves enter the external auditory canal and strike the tympanic membrane. Vibrations of this tympanic membrane, also known as the eardrum, causes the ossicles to vibrate and the stapes to push against the membrane of the oval window in and out. The movement of the oval window sends fluid pressure waves into the paralymph of the scalae vestibuli, which then transmit them to the scalae tympani and eventually to the round window. The pressure waves move into the endolymph of the cochlear duct and cause the basilar membrane to vibrate, which moves the hair cells of the spiral organ against the tectorial membrane. This leads to bending of the stereocilia on top of the hair cells and ultimately the generation of a nerve impulse into the first order neurons in the cochlear nerve fibers. Sound waves of various frequencies causes different regions of the basilar membrane to vibrate more intensely than other regions. Each segment of the basilar membrane is tuned for a specific frequency. Now the cell bodies of the sensory neurons are located on the spiral ganglia, which is the part of the branch of the cranial nerve 8, known as a vestibulocochlear nerve. 
Those first order neurons then project over to the cochlear nuclei of the medulla oblongata, where those second order neurons travel over to the thalamus against the sensory relay area. And then the third order neurons project over to the primary auditory area of the cerebral cortex. Now auditory information that's sent in from the left ear and the right ear may differ slightly. And that allows us to locate sound based on the differences of the sensory information sent into the auditory area. The last of our special senses is equilibrium. Again, a function of the inner ear. The vestibular apparatus, which is going to consist of the saccule and the utricle of the vestibule, and then the three semicircular canals surrounding. In order to determine the functions of the vestibule and the semicircular canals, we still need to find the two different components of equilibrium. We have static equilibrium and we have dynamic equilibrium. Static equilibrium is giving you the state of balance relative to the force of gravity. For instance, if I'm standing up, I know that gravity is pulling me down. Dynamic equilibrium is how we can maintain our balance whenever we change our positions. Now static equilibrium is controlled by the sensory hairs that we can see in the utricle as well as the saccule. Here to the image to the right, you can see the hair cells embedded within the macula. We see supporting cells that help support, just like the supporting cells that we learned in all of our other specialized senses. And on top of the hair cells are going to involve the stereocilia, which are these projections on the apical side. Now the autolithic membrane is going to be a series of hairs where the stereocilia are embedded within. And on top of the autolithic membrane are these autoliths that we can see on the next slide over. So this membrane is going to contain those calcium carbonate crystals called autoliths that move whenever our head position is changed. Here you can see the man to the right, his head upright, and you can see the hair cells project upward. When his head is tilted forward, what's going to happen is that the gravity is going to force that autolithic membrane to move forward. And autolithic crystals which weigh down the autolithic membrane will fall forward as well, which will end up bending the stereocilia on top of the hair cells. Those changes in the movement of the stereocilia will open up transduction channels that result in graded potentials which will send over to the central nervous system. On the other hand, dynamic equilibrium is maintained by the sensory hairs, the ampulla of the semicircular canals. As we can see on the next slide over, here we have the semicircular canals to determine our three-dimensional position in space. You can see on the next slide over when we take a look at the cristae, which is this elevation on the inside of the semicircular canal, which is going to contain hair cells embedded within the cupula. Very similar to the same setup that you saw earlier for static equilibrium. Whenever movement takes place, the endolymph, the fluid within the semicircular canal, will end up moving that cupula, causing movement of the entire bundle. With head movement, it's going to cause shifts in the fluid that will cause the cupula to bend and drag side to side, allowing us to determine the direction of movement. That direction of movement will result in action potentials that are again sent over to our central nervous system to determine changes in our position. All information conveying static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium will then be sent up the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve in combination with sensory input coming in from the eyes as well as our kinesthetic receptors known as our proprioceptors gives us sensory information about our position in space. Thus, static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium serve as the last form of proprioception to give us information about our position in space as well as movement of the head and our extremities.